Hello and welcome to the Sports Grab Podcast, your bite-sized guide to enter the sports industry. And joining me, as per usual, is the cricket tragic, Reuben Williams. How are you, mate? G'day, Ryan. I'm doing fantastic. Thank you. I'm super excited for this episode. I've been playing cricket for about 18 years of my life. Last season, I think I managed about two games. Work is starting to take over. You know, at one point in time, I was literally making graphs on uh, the opposition players, ranking their strengths and weaknesses. So the next time when we came up against them in the season, we'd have a better idea of how to play. That is tragic. That is tragic. <laughs> <laughs> that has started to fade as sports grade has taken over. But I still love the game. Absolutely. Yeah, my, my career, career dwindled away a couple of years ago. I had a great little career at Wycliffe playing in H grade. It was, it was great fun. Um, you had the chance to make your first century as well, but threw it away. I did. Yeah, I did. And, but <laughs> not in the me. not in the typical way that many people throw their wicket away. You <laughs> literally retired. you didn't show up the next week. <laughs> you run about eighty seven not out, thirteen runs away from the magical number, and you thought I'm going to go to a a long lunch or something the following week instead. I went to the McLaughlin's polo event down at their farm. <laughs> <laughs> With my beloved footy club, Uni Blues, but that is another topic for another day. <laughs> Great cricket content, though, which we're going to get into today, which is mm. super exciting. Uh, so let's get into it. Uh, my name's Ryan Walker, he's Ruben Williams, and we are two mates who met at Cricket Australia, and now we help people find their own dream jobs through this very podcast and our online community. If you want to follow us, head over to LinkedIn or even better, if you want to connect with us and hundreds of others working in sport, jump into the Sports Grad community. Speaking of the Sports Grad community, I want to give a special shout out to one of our members. His name's Jake Martin, lives over in Adelaide. He's just landed a job as a player agent with the group called Centimetre Perfect. Now, a lot of people aspire to be a player agent. It's one of the first things people think of when they think of sport management. Jake yep. has gone and done it. He's going to be managing the likes of uh, in, um, budding AFL players coming into the system. So well done, Jake. That's an incredible foot in the door that you've got for yourself. So if you are like Jake and you want to try and live out your dreams in the sports industry or if you're an organisation that's looking to hire people quickly and easily, uh, there's reasons for both of you to jump into the sports grad community where people get their first full-time job. So to get involved with that, head to www.sportsgrad.com.au forward slash community and you can be a part of it. Awesome, Rubes. Uh, special shout out to our biggest supporter and that is Deakin University who has been with us since day one. If you're currently studying or you've just finished studying, having a postgrad qualification in sports management on your resume can give you a massive leg up on other potential candidates applying for the same role. So you want to pump up your resume and get specialised knowledge in pretty much every single area of sport that you could think of, take a look at Deakin's postgrad qualifications. Their Master of Business in Sports Management is not one of, but the best one in Australia. So it's ranked at number one. So I'd probably mm. get on there and, and, uh, and do that one. Absolutely. Now, Ryan, our special guest today is Ian Higgins from The Grade Cricketer, which is a global phenomenon, live show, podcast, they got books, they got merch, they got everything. Uh, and the way it came about was these guys, as wide-eyed juniors, The Grade Cricketer dreamed of playing cricket for Australia one day. And that was before entering the dog-eat-dog -dog world of Australian grade cricket, where their hopes and dreams were swiftly extinguished and their cricketing careers subsequently laid to rest. So, as a form of catharsis, the grade cricketer was born, a desperate, delusional every man that thousands of middling amateur, am amateur, <laughs> amateur athletes, a little tongue-tie there, yeah. can relate to, even if they refuse to admit it publicly. So now it's a cult podcast, a TV show, a live show, social media presence. They've got books. They've got everything. They've got 100,000 followers on Twitter, 100,000 followers on YouTube, 2,500 Patreon subscribers. It's just going nuts. And Ian is on the show today to tell us how it all came about. Yes, absolutely mammoth episode this one. I don't think I've laughed ever on a podcast <laughs> episode. So that is something to look forward to. Uh, but I absolutely love just his – how he told the story about how the great cricketer began – uh, he goes through from the very start, I think it was 2011 that he started to get into it, all the way to now. And as he mentioned, live shows, podcasts, books, huge social presence. It's an absolute beast. Uh, so it's great hearing that journey. 
Mm. Another thing to look forward to is what makes their podcast great. Now, there was, there was a lot of self-interest in our questions because we want to be a great podcast too. So we're just going to have picked and picked and picked and to find out what are the nuggets of gold that bring the great cricketer together. So if you uh, want to learn more about what goes on behind the scenes of the great cricketer podcast, uh, Ian will say reveals all. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> reveals more than all. <laughs> yeah. uh, I was not lying when I said this is the probably the funnest episode we've ever done. <laughs> Uh, you'll hear a lot of laughs, so bear with us. Yeah. Uh, but this is an absolute cracker. So grab a pen, enjoy this chat with Ian Higgins. Ian, welcome to the Sports Grab Podcast. That was extremely abrupt. <laughs> <laughs> was me abrupt. Was about that. Thank you very much for having me. No, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, my favourite topic to talk about me. Uh, so let's get into it. Awesome. Skip well, the intro, talk about me now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, obviously, great cricketer podcast. Anyone who's listening to this, check it out. They would have probably checked it out already. But um, let us know sort of where it all start, where it begin. So it's a bit of an evolution with the great cricketer, I suppose. It started on Twitter in 2011. Uh, well, that's a long time ago now. Um, and and then we developed this char- this anonymous character online. We just started doing these tweets anonymously. Um, there was three of us at the time, Sam, Dave, and I, and um, and we sort of developed this this anonymous character that people people seem to enjoy these dark existential thoughts you have playing cricket um, that might bleed into other parts of your life, and um, and then I guess we had just developed this character went a bit viral. Some people were interested in it, and then we wrote a book uh, in 2015, um, self titled The Great Cricketer, and that's when we sort of revealed our anonymity, um, our three names behind it. So. Um, and then in 2016, we started a podcast. 2017, we wrote a second book. Uh, and then 2018, I think we got a TV show. And then we do live shows and all that sort of stuff. So it's a bit of an evolution with all those projects. But when we started tweeting in 2011, we didn't think we'd um, <laughs> uh, you know, be touring around internationally and doing you know, big podcasts and TV shows and all that stuff. Uh, that's a lie. I actually did think that would happen, <laughs> <laughs> if I'm honest. Uh, Guys, here's the vision. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Here's the vision for 11 years' time. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's just been a bit of an evolution. We were just talking before about, like, even the podcast equipment and, and how all of that has evolved. Like, just the amount of flying hours you do at the beginning when you've got no idea what you're doing uh, is, yeah, uh, how you get to this point is uh, is crazy, but it's all... I don't know. It's like, it's just what I was saying before. Like when you start, you just do it because you enjoy it and you know, and then some other people enjoy it and they come along with the, on the journey and then before you know it, you're touring mm. internationally. So, yeah. Mm. yeah. And, well, and while you were tweeting, what were you doing at the time? Um, usually, uh, usually on the bathroom at a job that I hated. <laughs> um, just going to the bathroom for 45 minutes at a time, just <laughs> thinking about how many retweets I can get. So um, I, uh, at the time, uh, I was working at um, Foxtel. I was doing like, production stuff at Foxtel and then and then after that I did law and then I and then sort of at that time then the TJC started to make enough money to go full time very bad amount of money and I was like no nah, but I want to do that so so I left the law job um, for the real money podcasting yeah <laughs> that's where it is <laughs> that's why we're doing well, what guys, we're doing as you guys know yeah yeah <laughs> thank you for the Rolex you gave me before the <laughs> yeah <laughs> very nice um and in terms of, you know, when was the moment that you sort of thought, hey, um, this is going okay, um, so let's do it? I um, don't know if there was a tipping point. The, the thing that I think about the most where I was like, oh, this is actually a real thing. In 2019, we went over and toured England for because the, the Ashes were on in 2019. Mm. So we went over there and we did some live shows. On so Our live shows are like a – it's different to a live podcast. It's more of a, a stage – like it's more stand-up-y yeah. kind of thing. It's a show. Mm. Um, anyway, so we went there in 2019 and then we, um, we booked places in London, Birmingham, Newcastle, Manchester, Leeds, maybe somewhere else, I can't remember. Um, but then the, the show that we had in London – uh, it was at Leicester Square Theatre, which is a um, quite a big theatre on the West End. Actually, Ricky Gervais just performed there. Um, so therefore, I'm Ricky Gervais. <laughs> yeah. um, but we, we sold out our first show in a day, um, in a day there. That was wow. in 2019. And we were like, we had, some, we had a bit of traction then. And, um, but it was at that moment I was like, oh, this is, this is a real thing that you could actually probably do. I mean, mm. we were already full-time at that point. But, mm. um, you know, Australia's a pretty small market for, for what we do. Um, so to have international appeal was was quite exciting. So yeah, I think it was at that point. 
Um, but before then, you just, yeah, you're kind of bumbling along, just enjoying it. I was yeah. enjoying not having to wear a, a suit every day, <laughs> to be honest, yeah. And now you've just done your first live show in India, which is a, a massive mark. You must be licking your lips. <laughs> 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 That's how I see people. I see those customers. <laughs> um, yeah, to be honest, the Indian – we okay, if you work in cricket, you are very aware of India – having a very enormous population, the love they have for the sport. It's one point, one point whatever billion. One, one point, it's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and so you're very aware that, like, that's, that's a bit of a holy grail if you can make it there, I suppose. But we always thought that our type of humour, it's very dry, it's sarcastic. Um, I mean, English and Australian humour is quite similar. Kiwis are the same. Um, but, uh, but Indians, we, didn't, we weren't really sure. There's always been a little bit disconnect, actually in any form of... Um, like capitalism, like there's actually not much trade really between mm. Australia and India. And so cricket is the common ground. So we always knew that that was a thing that was going to happen. Um, uh, sorry, that was a thing that we could always aspire to, but we weren't sure if it was actually translatable. Um, and then in 20, when was that? Whenever they beat us, they, they, they beat us in a test series. Um, and then we, we, um, we went onto YouTube and then we just made a video reaction, reacting to Australia just losing. And then we picked up all this attention in Indian media, like um, like reputable newspapers, like um, agencies were like clipping up stuff from our, and we sort of exploded into India in that capacity. And then since then, it's been, um, yeah, it's just been unreal. Uh, and the, yes, yes, so I'm licking my lips <laughs> at, the, at the prospect of, um, no, it's, it, it is really exciting though. It's a, it's a whole new market. It's a place I've never been to before. So Pez and I just went there for like three days, uh, three, four days last week or two weeks ago. And uh, the the love that they have for the – I mean, every time anyone goes to India, they say the exact same things. It's extremely intense. There's heaps of people, um, and all the people are really nice. And all those things are a complete lie. There's no one there. <laughs> They're the worst people I've ever met. Um, everyone's so hospitable, beautiful people, and they look after you, and they love it. And uh, that's, that's really exciting. Um, and also, yeah, financially it could be very rewarding, so yeah. So yeah. You've got your agent in Goa just house hunting for you at the moment. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right, I'm moving to Chennai. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, oh, I've, I've always found it quite funny, like, how you just base it on cricket. Like, mm -hmm. why, why is cricket so funny? Like, I don't, I don't really, I don't get how we got to where we are today. Yeah. It'd be hard to create the same sort of niche in another sport, I think. Yes, yes. Very um, unique, very unique. It is. I think the nature of like how long the game goes for <laughs> yeah. is so frustrating. <laughs> the how tedious it is. Like, it, and so because Sam and I both played it, you know, like we joke about, we played the level where um, you were good but not good enough. So like the amount of effort we had to put into being like that level of rubbish <laughs> was, was quite frustrating. <laughs> Because then you play with guys who actually go on to make it. And you guys work at CA and you guys would have seen the size of those guys and, like, I'm just not that big. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. never had a chance. Um, but I think, like, the amount of time you spend on your own out in the field, like the, the nature of the Australian summers as well, the, the arid, dry heat, some of the grounds, the people you meet, it's... <laughs> so you're essentially just saying, like, cricket... Sucks. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> Is really that what you're saying? Yeah, it, it, yeah. And I say that as someone who obviously, like, I, I obviously like the sport. <laughs> <laughs> we all love it, but we hate it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're, all, we're all saying, like, no, we like it, don't we? But, <laughs> yeah. but we don't. <laughs> no, um, I don't know. It's also the people that are attracted to cricket clubs. Like, when I played other sports outside, I always found people had, like, um, I don't know, they were just different. They came from different backgrounds. They had more corporate jobs, I suppose, or maybe aspirations of careers and stuff. I never met any of these people in cricket. They were sort of like <laughs> floating through life. Everyone broadly my age now, but like just sort of still working a bit part-time, which is fine, by the way. But yeah. like, but just they would ridicule you for not making a training twice a week and why can't you make training? I've mm. got a job. I can't be yeah. at the park at 2 o'clock on a Wednesday afternoon to help put up the nets. Mm. So, <laughs> oh, don't you care about the club? Not really. <laughs> I don't really need this, to be honest. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, it is very specific to cricket. I, but I think it's like – I think that's why sledging exists in cricket as well because mm. the amount of time you spend on a field and it's just boring and it's just men spending too much time together. It mm. just creates toxicity, <laughs> unfortunately. But financially for me, quite, quite beneficial. Yeah. yeah. So. Cricket's been good to you. <laughs> <laughs> it's been very good to yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, I'm a bit Chennai, haven't you heard? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so back in 2011, did you have one of these thoughts and thoughts to yourself? I better tweet this, see what other people think. Yes, definitely. Because I, I was, I still played until um, 20. I stopped playing when like our first book came out because. <laughs> Because so, he had significance in a job now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was like, but I was, uh, once we released the book, we started to get more recognition and stuff, especially in that community where you, you're representing, we were the great cricketer and I was playing great cricket. So <laughs> yeah. it was like, you can imagine how well great cricketers would take that. Oh, you're the great cricketer. Yeah. Right, mate? Yeah. <laughs> but um, one of my last games that I ever played in, um, I, I was like at the end of like, it was tedious. And I, <laughs> but I was at the end of my tether with the sport. And anyway, I, one of my last games I got, a duck in each innings. I dropped a guy on zero who then went on to get one of the most impressive 140s in about 60 balls that I've ever seen. He, got, he couldn't stop hitting sixes. It was unbelievable, but I dropped him on zero. And anyway, one of the guys in my team had just got a copy of our first book and he like, I was sitting outside the dressing room after the game. I just made two zeros in the game. I dropped the guy on zero, got 140. He like hands me this book and he goes, can you sign this? The opposition uh, dressing room door is open. So they're seeing me sign my own book when I've just yeah. had this game. I was like, I think it might be time, might be time for me to leave <laughs> this sport because, yeah, I have no credibility in the game anymore. Yeah. Um, yeah. But anyway, so the point was I, was I was still playing. I was still playing when I was 20. So, and I still think about it now because the amount of time that, I grew up around the sport, you know, same as anyone who loves the sport. They, you know, you, you, your family is probably obsessed with it. It's probably how you got into the sport in the first place. So I remember some of my earliest memories are cricket related, whether it be watching on TV or going to the SCG or, or whatever. Um, so, but anytime I like look at a cricket kit now, I can think of like seven tweets in my head straight away. Cause like the darkness just like envelops you. <laughs> <laughs> I hate cricket so much. <laughs> Please help me get out of it. <laughs> help me get out. Help. He says. <laughs> yeah. I thought this was a help center that I came to. Yeah. <laughs> uh. Um, talk to us about the podcast. Um, because every week you produce these like 90 minute plus episodes, which, you know, you, you start with an incredibly detailed rundown of what's happening in cricket. Then you might do an interview. Then you've got these questions. And in between, you've got these hilarious ads with Budgie Smuggler, Manscaped. And then you've got these remixes of sounds clipped into songs. I don't know who does that, but the whole production's quite detailed. So what goes on behind the scenes to put that together? So, um, yeah, well, originally, like, I started to put together some remixes um, just for just to make it more of an interesting soundscape for the listener. Because, you know, because if a show, the show we did yesterday went for maybe two hours, I think. And so if you just have, like, as interesting as this conversation obviously is for us, like, for, for a lot of people, if it went for two hours and it's just straight three white guys talking, it's like, it's not that interesting. So you are mm. like, to mix up this, the soundscape mm. a little bit, you know, just even to re refresh in the ears a little bit. So I started, like, doing mixes and stuff and, and they were just dumb. But now we've obviously got enough. We've got a big enough audience where people will start sending stuff into you. Um, Sam sent me something that uh, one of our subscribers had sent us yesterday, and I was at the gym and I played it, and I just I had to leave the gym because <laughs> I just completely lost. I can't play it because it's, it's completely scandalous. It would actually never, it would actually never see the light of day. That <laughs> that looks, but um, anyway, yeah. So to, to go into the podcast, um, it starts off with an agenda. So basically, during the week, cricket's like it's just all year round, and like obviously it's multinational, so. You know, it being our winter here has no impact on it being like they're playing the 100 in the UK. India's always doing some stuff. Uh, the West Indies are playing, you know, so that there's always cricket to talk about. And also it being the national sport here as well, there's always some intrigue about what our national players are doing. So um, you basically stay across the sport during the week. Um, but then you have an agenda, um, you run it down. We've obviously got a number of ads and we try and we're very lucky that our partners that we align with basically say, here's like some key points to hit in the ad but just go for it yeah. and that's way more interesting mm -hmm. for, for us and i think for most people as well like everyone's got different ways to read ads but um we try and make moments out of the ads like and and that makes it interesting as well mm -hmm. um and then interviews so sam does all the interviews he he lines up all the interviews um and yeah an interview is actually an interesting one because i feel like podcasting like like people expect the most famous person to be on a podcast every single week now. I'm not actually sure if it actually brings much anymore. And like if you get something interesting out of an interesting guest <clears throat> and they're willing to offer things and they talk about their life or they give you a little insight, then that's very valuable. But what's not valuable is like talking to someone for like 10 minutes and they'd be like, the boys worked hard, credit to the boys, game two halves, you mm. know, work hard next week, etc. No one mm. gets anything out of that. Yeah. <clears throat> so 
But I guess that's like just the skill of an interview question, just trying to get interesting moments and, and try and do some research and, and show them a bit of love, show them they're safe. Because our thing's so silly that mm. they don't want to go into, um, you know, our interview and being like, I don't want to say anything which makes the news the next day. Mm. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, you've got to give them a bit of love in the room to make them feel safe. And then, yep. and then they say something dumb and then that makes the news. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, uh, and then, yeah, um, so we record it. It takes a long time to record. I mean, it, it, like your guys' podcast is where you guys do a bit top and tail and then you do this bit as well, right? So um, it takes broadly like a day to, to mm. put together the show and then the post-production is like, it's more than the recording bit. Yeah. So, mm. um, and that's where the real fun happens. Mm. Um, no, nah, it's like, you know, it's just an essential part of it. But because there's so many podcasts these days, uh, if you have any little advantage, any, oh, okay. I think that like podcasts, you need to have a niche. You need to have an angle. You guys have a great angle. Um, and, and we have an angle as well. We're talking about, you know, cricket in a, in, in a new way. And we're trying to bring a new audience, younger audience to the game, I suppose. It's not our intention, but I think it's just the way it worked out. Um, so if you have a niche, that's a very, that makes your podcast automatically, you'll find an audience with that because everyone can have like a top 40, um, mm. you know, um, podcast where you talk about generic things like a, a daily talk show style thing what's happening in the world today you've got to be very very famous and very very good <laughs> to have an audience talking about what's happening in the world today like unless you're the bbc yeah. um so niches are good and then any little elements outside of that production elements or just an angle or an idea can make can elevate your entire thing beyond you know a couple of guys having a chat in the room mm. do you feel like you're always trying to update things you're doing you know change little bits and pieces because it feels like there's just a million podcasts now yep. and, and you've got to keep changing it because people get sick of the same thing yes absolutely yes yeah. sam and i every summer we, we still operate because we, we're year round but every australian summer <clears throat> we try and update either like the intro music ele- uh, introduce like a new element to the show uh new soundscaping new stings new way to do an ad all these little things, because if you stay still, you're going backwards. I mean, it's a cliche, but it really is true in podcasting because there's just there's so many. Mm. That, I mean, like, I feel like the <clears throat> when we started in 2016, I think it was, um, podcasts were already big, but they're 15 times, 20 times bigger now. It's, you know, I'm not saying like there's no point start trying to start a podcast now. It's just it's harder. It's a lot harder now, but there are more podcasts because more people listen to podcasts. And I feel like I'm still amazed that radio exists. Mm. Like I was listening to the radio the other day. I was in an Uber and like, I don't know, what, I still don't know what stations are here, but someone like called up and was like, hey, I want to listen to Justin Bieber easy. And I was like, <laughs> you have 17, you want to listen to that right now? Yeah. <laughs> I and can make rung. that happen for you in the back of an Uber. I can tell you how to do that. Yeah. How does radio... But like all the money, yeah. not all of it, a lot of money is still tied up in that, that sort of old media. That mm, mm. Why? Why yeah. Why doesn't she just listen to Spotify, YouTube? <laughs> just chuck iTunes. it on your head- headphones. Everything's so accessible. <laughs> like. just, just tell Siri to play it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that call is unusual. Call the radio station, listen to it. I don't know. It doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. Anyway, mm. But the point is that like um, more and more people listen to podcasts. More people relate to it. Yeah. Um, there's something, maybe like a, yeah, our generation, I think, moving away from old media. I mean, does anyone actually watch television anymore? I mean, mm. I have a television show and I don't watch it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's not very good to be fair, but, um, you know, it's just, you know, streaming services. Like people are always, people are busier, you know, mm. people have, people don't even watch the sport anymore. You know, like I was, I'm a big Liverpool fan in the Premier League. I have an option to like watch 90 minutes, 45 minutes, 24 minutes, nine minutes, three minutes if I want to. Yeah. And like, and like, why would I watch 90 minutes so I can get the <laughs> yeah. same – I go on Twitter yeah. at the same time and I can read the, some people's – The Saturday night goals on Optus Sport, that's the best thing ever. Perfect. You just watch the goals. Yeah. I don't feel like I'm any busier in my life, but I feel like I want to be busier. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The more things I fill my day with. <clears throat> yeah. Um, anyway, yeah, I guess the point is that my, more people listen to podcasts and so there's, there's, there's still audience there. It's, I just think it's, it is harder because the, the mass of podcasts now. So anything you can mm. do to elevate that – um, and for me, having a niche is the easiest way to find an audience. Mm. Um, it's almost easier to make them because this machine is more accessible. Exactly. But it's, it's harder to have cut through. Yes, mm. that's definitely and true. And that's where the niche comes into it. That's definitely true. 
we were talking before about um, like when we started and the equipment that we used. So Sam, Dave and I at the time were living at, when we started, we were living in three different cities. <clears throat> and so we were using, we were using Skype, if you guys remember that technology. What <laughs> Didn't Skype have a monopoly yeah. on communication? Then the pandemic hit. <laughs> That were dominating. 100%. Imagine if someone sent you a Skype invite now. I'm just going to jump on Skype. Are we? We used to but chat on Skype all day at, at work. Yeah. Yeah. Now it's like, oh, what? Are we? I had, <laughs> I had never heard of Zoom before, before the pandemic. Yeah. Mm. That's been a big winner. Not many people talk about the winners of the pandemic. Zoom. Yeah. No. <laughs> um, anyway, yeah. So we used to jump on um, <clears throat> Skype and we had USB microphones and we're all living in separate apartments. We we're trying to like soundproof it as best we could. I remember doing some podcasts early in the morning. I had like a doona over my head to like soundproof the room. If anyone like walked into my apartment, we're like doing like the World Cup in 2019. <laughs> it's, it's a man like trying to be a ghost, just like talking about Joss Butler's 75 in the semi final or whatever. Um, you know, but like all those flying hours count. But yeah, the, so. But I remember at like the beginning, like, our sound was terrible because people in London would complain that they couldn't hear it on the tube. Like, anyone who's been in London knows that the tube's like a noisy place, right? And so that our, our sound quality wasn't good enough where if there was background noise in their life, they couldn't hear us talk. So it's mm. like people, don't, people can't put up with that anymore. I, I mean, like, people will put up with bad vision. Like, so, like, these, these cameras right now, if they were a little bit blurry or whatever, they'll put up with it if the sound's good. Mm. But p- people won't put up with good sound. It's so frustrating when, like, mm. when it's bad sound. So, like, I mean, there's so many technological advances with that. I think because of the explosion of podcasting, this machine right here, the Rodecaster Pro, um, is, like, a complete game changer, which is relatively affordable. Um, but, like, you, you have to have good kit because, mm-hmm. <laughs> because if you've got bad kit now, like, no one's going to listen to you, which is one of the advantages that we had we started when people did put up with that. Yeah. Um, but if we did that now, people would complain a lot. And they already complain a lot, but um, <laughs> but yeah, even more so, yeah. Mm. yeah. S- some of the guests you get on now, they're the biggest names in cricket around the world, Ricky Ponting, mm-hmm. et cetera. Were you getting these guys on your podcast from day dot or did you have to know a few people who knew a few people to get to that point? We're very lucky that we had a big social media following at the beginning. Um, so the first year of our podcast, we were actually with Fox Sports, um, I think that just lasted one year. Yeah, it was. So um, our first, I think our first ever guest was Ed Cowan, but he was a fan of our social media. So we had that, we had that advantage at the beginning. Um, we were very, very lucky because a lot of people don't have, like people would kill for the, the social reach that we have and we, mm. we had a big audience then. I think the second one we ever had was Merv Hughes, but I think because we were in the community that they were talking to, great cricket, we had, we still had, and I was still playing, I think, was one of the other guys still playing? Might have been. But we still had links to clubs or we knew someone mm. who knew someone. Ed Cowan was like very, very good to us at yeah. the beginning. He would like um, – he would text guys to try and get them on the show for us. And it helped at the beginning when we were with Fox Sports. We had a little bit of credibility, I suppose. But I think most people were coming to us through – Twitter. I don't think we even had Instagram then. When did Instagram become big? Like 2011, 2012. 2012, I reckon I started. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. We, we, we used to get 10 likes. I was like, four. Yeah, once it turned into like the numbers instead of just like the names used to put yeah. on the bottom. Yeah, it was big. That was, that, was, that was big, yeah. But we didn't get we didn't get on Instagram until like 20, like we were late. Yeah. We didn't get on Facebook until 20. Anyway, um, so we had social media following, but um, – so we were always very lucky that we had access to, to good guests and, and they were willing to talk. I don't know why. I feel like actually people, if you just ask them, most people actually yeah. will say yes. Most mm. people will come back to you and say yes. I'm not, I'm not talking about like just from our experience. I'm not talking about any podcast. Like if you just like, mm. if you had a contact and you reach out to them, most people will at least reply. And mm. then like even if they get a no, I feel like that yeah. getting a no is way better than just getting a couple of blue ticks. Mm. Not, not many say no to us. No. You know, on a, obviously yeah, yeah. a lesser scale, but you know. I don't think we've maybe a handful, maybe. Well, to, your point, to your point at the start of the show, everyone love talk, loves talking about themselves. So <laughs> give, give an opportunity and away you go. Like, you got, yeah. I was looking at you guys before um, and you guys have had some very impressive guests on here. You guys have done really well. To, like you had Gil McLaughlin, you had Simon Hill. Uh, Hamish, Hamish McLaughlin. Hamish. Sorry, Hamish, sorry, Hamish McLaughlin. Hamish Gil's McLaughlin. a work in progress. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah. He is leaving your blue ticks, yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Hamish, Hamish yeah. Um, you know, some, like you've had some very impressive people on here. But again, it's just it goes to show you just – you give someone some bait and just yeah. say if they want to go just for ask. it, then you just yeah. ask. Yeah. And yeah. honestly, we've got, we've, we've had people knock us back before <clears throat> and uh, that's fine. Like it's mm. it, like, if they just say, no, I'm busy or whatever, 
Like obviously secretly you harbour a deep resent for that person <laughs> for years. Is that why you pitted Bradman against Sachin? Because Sachin, you want to come on the, on the podcast? Well, Bradman wouldn't come on. That was the big, that was the big thing. It's just, yeah, never replies. Unbelievable. It's unbelievable. I hate that guy. Overrated. <laughs> <laughs> There's something quite taboo about Bradman, isn't it? He's just untouchable. Like, <laughs> yeah. That's why it's funny to mock him. But you can't, can't rip Bradman. You nah, can't. Yeah, well, no. yeah, well. Paul Kelly's writing songs about him, so there's this aura. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's right. That's right. Um, but yeah, honestly, it's much better to get a no than no, no reply. Because even mm. no reply is just, it's rude, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. Tough to, tough to take. Tough mm. to take, yeah. Is, um, is Sam a journalist by background? He used to work in communications. Mm. Um, so when I was doing law, he was doing communications. And then we sort of left both those jobs at the same time to do TGC full time. Um, but then he has done some journalist work. Yeah, yeah. So mm. he, he's written articles for The Guardian. I think he's written stuff for the ABC as well. So he's he's much more of the journalist side, whereas I'm more interested in telling the jokes. Mm. Um, but... Um, so, so yeah, he give, he gives very good credibility to some of the s- more serious conversations that we we talk about because we talk about we do talk about serious things like how overrated Bradman was. <laughs> <laughs> no, we talk about serious stuff like we address like racism quite quite regularly when it was a, a big topic in, in cricket maybe a year ago. <clears throat> so, um, and Sam's like Sam's really good on that stuff, and 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 he is very good on research and, and background and that stuff. So, and that those those skills would come from 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 journalism, yeah. But his corporate mm. backgrounds communications mm. were you going to mention the time when you froze in the bar when you met him that time <laughs> oh, no, you I, I, was, I wasn't going to talk about adelaide Oval, no. oh. <laughs> <laughs> what happens can you tell me what happened oh we're in oh, a bar we're... in adelaide for the adelaide test we're with a, a good mate of ours um josh martin used to work in comms at, i know josh yeah yeah yep. yep. um sam perry walks in sees josh ruben and i are just sitting there obviously had a had a couple of beers and yeah ruben's just like oh my god it's sam perry <laughs> No, I, I asked him. I was like, "Are you Sam Perry?" He yeah. goes, "No." <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> "And I was like, no, I'm pretty sure you're Sam Perry." He goes, "No," nah, and then left. <laughs> really? Oh, that's unbelievable. That's an alpha. <laughs> Someone sent me uh, when I went back. I'm from, from Sydney. I went back home maybe two or three months ago, and someone had sent me. You know, when someone doesn't follow you on Instagram or you don't follow them, it goes to your message requests. So I went through that and it was like from two weeks ago, someone had sent me a photo from like across the bar of me in a bar. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell is that? Was there any, any <laughs> caption or context attached Absolutely to it? Absolutely zero context. <laughs> oh, I see you. Like, what is coming on? Like, there you are. <laughs> yeah. It's just like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do <laughs> with this information. Tim. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's always a guy. It's yeah, always a guy. that's brilliant. Um, the reason I asked about Sam is because one thing you mentioned earlier is about you know how you've developed your questioning and, and framing of the interviews. Mm-hmm. Um, with your law background, is, is that something that you've had to work on and, and has Sam been helpful to that? Um, so I worked in law for about eight minutes. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I, yeah. It's a funny one with law because it's um, – I suppose it's like it's it's one of the bigger degrees, right? And so people talk about it, but I, don't, I definitely don't see myself as a lawyer or anything, like because um, c- I'm not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so that probably helps. Um, but that's that serious element or that analytical element. I've learned heaps from Sam for sure. Like, you, and you if if you're working with someone like like you guys, if you haven't worked, if you haven't, um, sorry, helped each other and something, or learnt something from the other person, then like. It's probably the wrong person to be working with. Um, so Sam, Sam's taught me heaps of different things, and I've taught him nothing, which is alarming. <laughs> but um, but yeah, like ever since I was uh, maybe like twelve or thirteen, like I knew I wanted to be a comedian. I just wanted to, I just wanted to make people laugh uh, in in any interaction. This interaction, talking to the listeners now, my job, talking to my family, any interaction, I just want to make people laugh. That's all I've ever wanted to do, and so. Um, a bigger question I get is like, why'd you do law? And I don't have an answer for that just yet. I don't know why I did that. Like I just, I was playing cricket overseas and I came back cause I realized I wasn't any good. So I was like, oh, I should get a, I should go to uni cause that's what people do. Yeah. So I just did law. I think cause I was seeing someone at the time who was doing law. And so I, I was like, oh, I'll be cool as well. And I'll do some law. <laughs> now I've got enormous hex debt. <laughs> um, but, but all I've ever wanted to do is make people laugh. And so, um, yeah, even going to like we're interviewing um, a West Indian cricketer this afternoon, and I don't care about what his stats are. I just want to hear a story. I want to get a story out of him which will make me laugh, which will make him laugh. Because if he's laughing, 
then the audience will laugh, you know? Um, but, you know, sometimes you've got to talk about serious stuff as well. But um, I think I've gone around the houses about answering this question. But <laughs> yeah, yes, yes, I've learned heaps from Sam. But in terms of my law degree, using that um, for my job, mm, only saying like libelous things, I suppose. <laughs> 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 Knowing what not to say. Mm. Um, but no, nah, I don't think I've really... I don't know, have I? I guess like when you do a big degree like that, you, you just, you're doing research mm-hmm. all the time, you're reading all the time, which and that, that skill is good for other elements of your life for sure. But I don't know, I just like telling stupid jokes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, a, a lot of people have, you know, social accounts and ideas and whatnot and they have huge followings, but yeah. they can't necessarily commercialise that to make it their full-time job, right. which you've been able to do. So... How did that come about, like the commercial side of the great cricketer? So, again, we were very lucky the first year we got – how did we uh, – we had an introduction to Fox Sports um, who weren't doing podcasting at the time, I don't think. Or maybe they were just getting into it. And so we got paid automatically that first year we had it. So we were very, very lucky to have that. Um, and did that come through like a ne- someone in your network that you yes, just knew? Yes, it did. It did. It came from a journalist um, who Sam knew because Sam was – trying to do a bit more journalism and stuff. So he knew someone who then gave us an introduction to someone at Fox Sports. Then we had a meeting, then they paid us that first year. But then, yeah, it, it didn't it didn't work out for us at Fox Sports. And so that second year, we were um, independent. And so then we had to like, go out and try and find the money yourself. And that's significantly harder, especially, yeah. and that's actually the hardest thing. So Sam and I right now, it's just two-man operation. Sam does almost all the commercials. He looks after so many of the relationships as well. I do all the production side of things. But we're already at a tipping point where, like, our audience is too big and there's too many other jobs, other opportunities for us to just remain as two. Um, and so, because, you know, I want to I want to make the best show possible and that means, like, thinking about what to say beforehand, preparation beforehand, and then afterwards spending so much time in my day doing production elements and Sam spending so much of his day trying to bring money into the business is a waste of our time because like, cause the, the audience doesn't care about where the money's coming from. They just mm. want the best show possible. They want the best get the, the best guests. They want the best jokes. They want the best stings. They want, they want the best show possible for their experience. Cause also people listen probably like one in four. Like I feel mm. like there were so many podcasts and I, I know my, my habits changed during COVID as well. I used to listen to podcasts all the time. I think you get bored of them and you drop in and out, but then something big will happen in the cricket or, or soccer or whatever, and you'll be like, oh, I'm going to listen this week. So, But for that show that people listen, it's got to be the best show possible. And so, yeah, if you're lucky enough to have a team around you to actually start doing other jobs and that, that can make your job better as well. Anyway, so the, 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 the second year, um, we Sam, had a f- uh, Sam used to work at um, – uh, AIM, which is an indigenous mentoring program. And uh, when he worked there, he worked with another guy, um, Adam Linforth, who is now the CEO of Budgie Smuggler. And Budgie Smuggler is our main um, uh, sponsor now for the, for the podcast. And so they had that relationship. And so Sam pitched an idea to, to Linny um, to sponsor our show. And then we were sort of, we had funding through that. And then once you have funding, then once the money side of the business is sorted to a degree, we were still part time at this point. Um, then it makes other elements easier. Once there's once the money bit sorted, so then you can grow your audience because the show is better. Um, and then I wouldn't say people necessarily come to you. We're, we're getting a little bit of that now, especially in India, where like we probably have a bit of groundswell of support and people are starting to offer you stuff. But um, yeah, you still got to go out there and hunt for your hunt for your food, which is takes a long time because you get you get knocked back a lot and there are so many podcasts and our podcast is a big podcast it's like one of the biggest in australia but like but it's still in comparison like when we talk to manscaped like our numbers are like yeah okay like <laughs> we we sponsor rogan sometimes it's like, yeah like, we yeah, can't yeah, compete with job. rogan <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so there's always someone bigger but you're always hunting for your food but you just i suppose with us we've always looked for partners that um Maybe not necessarily aligned. So, so we don't we don't do gambling sponsors. That's just a decision that we made. We don't. If people want a gambling sponsors, you can find gambling sponsors. Like, um, and that's <laughs> if you watch any sport, you're probably going to be you know hit in the face with a few gambling adverts. And that like that's just a moral thing that Sam and I've decided that we don't want to pursue. And that's actually set us back a little bit um, because there was actually a time with our TV show. Am I allowed to say this? Yeah, let's find out what happens. Um, <laughs> 
where it got to a point where it was like, well, do you either want to do the show with gambling adverts or there'd be no show because there was going to be no funding. And we, we held out, long story short, the show still went ahead, no gambling adverts. So we, we were lucky. But it was going to be a point where it's like, well, you know, Sam's got a family and, um, you know, I've got a drinking problem. Um, <laughs> so, so <laughs> you know, so we've all got money to spend. <laughs> so it's like, okay, you've got to look after your family um, and do the show or with with some, uh, you know, gambling adverts or, or not. And, Anyway, um, but yeah, but our, our advertising, the, the people we, that we've targeted or, or tried to get on the show are sort of like manscaped and budgie smuggler. They're sort of, you know, liberal brands and they can, um, you know, it sort of fits into our show a little bit. So yep. um, I suppose you start with their beer companies. We're, we're just, we've done beer companies before, alcohol companies. Um, yeah, manscaped, budgie smuggler, and some other stuff probably. Um, but yeah, once they give you the ad reads to do and they just like – just go and do them. It's the most fun thing where you can just talk absolute rubbish about <laughs> a company. Yeah. yeah. And what about the other streams that you've got in terms of like your, your Patreon and, and your live shows and your books and other different things? How did they start to enter that sort of circle of things you do? When the pandemic hit in 2020, our our company was worth $0 because at that point we weren't even sure if sport was going to be played, if you guys remember that. And so if there was no sport going to be played, it was like, well, what are we talking about? Mm. Um, we weren't sure if... Um, any of the companies like Budgie Smuggler had any marketing revenue, like how their business would be impacted. Would they have any advertising spend to give us? Like, um, and so at that point, we uh, there was no live shows. Uh, we weren't going to do a TV show because cricket wasn't going to be played. Um, so it was quite an alarming time. Um, and so we decided to start Patreon. And Patreon, for people who don't know, is like a, it's just a website or an app. And creators go and put content on there, and people sign up for um, a fixed amount, whatever the creator decides. For us, it's five or ten US dollars a month, and um, and then they get a bonus uh, episode per week. So that's what we do. Um, and so we just had that idea of. Um, how can we try and create like a community? First and foremost, it was a community idea. It was obviously to raise revenue as well. There was no doubt about that. Um, but we were very lucky that we had a big enough audience and enough of a social following and <clears throat> we felt good enough about the content we were putting out where people would actually come and join us on this on this journey. And it's honestly been that Patreon completely revolutionised our business. Um, so now we've got about 2,500 people every month who pay either five or 10 US a month. Oh, hey. um, and that having that direct relationship, like, so, cause then, then your audience is your boss, which mm. is the single best thing that you can do. Now, obviously like Sam and I are in a very fortunate position where we're able to do that because of the audience we already had. So we've got like, you know, you get 1% of your audience to come and pay you some money, then you're going to be okay. Um, but that just completely revolutionized our business and, and, the freedom of which you have when the audience wants you to just be yourself and they're willing to pay money out of their own accounts. And it's like, it's amazing because, I mean, I know my subscription services, I've got like about 15 of them. I've got like Netflix, Amazon, yeah. OnlyFans. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Netflix, Amazon, Spotify, iTunes, <laughs> um, Binge, Optus Sport, yeah. um, Stan, like all of them. And like... So people like still spending like an extra $5 a month just to get a couple of, a couple of extra shows a week for us is like, that's enormously rewarding. So those are your super fans. Yeah. Um, and they'll come to your live shows and they'll buy your merchandise and, and, um, and they'll listen to you almost every week. Um, so those people are like the, those people are the OGs, but like having them as your boss and like having that as like basically a, a stable part of our business, which we obviously want to grow. We want to bring more people into the community because we still talk to them every day and, you know, on forums and stuff like that. Um, is the single best thing because they don't really care as long as the show is good. They don't care what mm. you say as long as the show mm. is good and you're a good person to them and then that's that's mm. that's really rewarding. We did a bit of research into different podcasts and the Patreon offering that they were doing and uh, we were looking at yours compared to others and what you guys offer on Patreon was of like far greater value mm -hmm. to your audience than what some of these other podcasts were offering. These other podcasts, the offerings seem to kind of fall flat or it wasn't that different to what they did in the normal show. Yeah. How did you decide what to put behind Patreon? Very interesting you say that, Ruben, because um, when we were setting it up, what we didn't want it to be would just be a tip jar. We, did, we didn't want it to be just like, you know, pandemic's hard for us, the podcasters. Yeah. Like, I don't care about what's happening with you guys. Can you just give us some cash? Like, mm. that, that would be the single worst thing that we – and we had absolutely zero interest in it just being like a tip jar to throw us a couple of bucks to keep this thing going. Mm. So we wanted to create value and Sam and I are talking, cause this is a really valuable part of our business. 
not only just in a you know economic sense, but in a in a like caring about your audience sense as well. People are going to willing to because our audience for the most part is between eighteen and thirty five, and a lot of them are on the younger end of that scale. So young people probably at uni offering you know what's five US dollars a month? I don't know, like seven or eight dollars or mm. ten. Ten's like fifteen, right? It's a lot, a lot of money per month for a podcast. So that, like the, you, you got to put effort into that. You know, you can't just like turn up and just press record and just hope that some genius comes out of your brain and yeah. that'll do that week. Or and yeah, so you got to put it like quality content. So we we. We thought about um, how to really give value to those people, and so and once people saw value, then more people would come to it. That was just our theory, um, and so we d- we do all of our because our, our YouTube work is quite separate to our sort of like main podcast work. I, I know probably they're similar things. So all of the audio of our YouTube shows goes um, behind the paywall on Patreon because a lot of people don't watch YouTube; they just they or they don't, sorry they don't consume TJC through the eyes; they listen to us through the ears, and so. Um. Yeah, and then they get a they get a. Uh, I was going to say free show, but it's not free because they pay for it. Um, they, get, <laughs> they, they get an extra show per week, which we put we try and put as much effort into as possible. And that's like the that's what we call Ask TGC, where people write in questions and like crowdsourcing that content. I mean, some of the genius of what some people write into us is, um, and a lot some of the illegal things that people write into us as well. <laughs> quite uh, quite amazing, but um. But yeah, I mean, all of these things can plum, come from complete privilege of having a, enough of an audience where people care about the thing you do. But this is like, this is the central tenet of what we're talking about. If you have a niche in a podcast, there is community that's already formed and that they're almost looking for some like some nucleus to connect to. Mm. And I feel like TGC with like grade cricket's like the, you know, the, well, it's premier cricket now. But it's just club cricket. It's just, mm. it's just amateurs going rounds and just giving it a go. And so most people who like write to us aren't trying to play for Australia. They're trying to score 10 on the weekend and they're playing on carpet playing carpet (laughs) exactly and we don't respect those people but (laughs) (laughs) i'm actually annoyed that they listen to the show yeah (laughs) yeah i Um, lost so much money from this podcast i just (laughs) ripping the audience bradman was crap yeah Yeah. um (laughs) so you you found a way that the most valuable thing you put behind a white paywall is the the messages that the community is sending in. Yes, that's mm. right. That's right. And we we just formed um, community around that because when you do a post on Patreon, like people comment under the post, it's the same as any social media. And then people are like replying to that. And then there are people talking to each other who don't know each other. Some people might be from New Zealand talking to a guy in India. Like So there's community formed around that. Um, and the central thing is like all we all have these similar experiences in cricket. Um, and then some of the better questions are actually – outside of cricket but they're loosely tied to cricket <laughs> which is also cool but um yeah it's, it's just community which is what a podcast but any podcast is the podcast you guys have you got community formed around this as well so mm. um yeah that's what i feel like podcasts are really mm. my uh my brother he called me the other week he never calls me and he was driving somewhere <laughs> oh god what's happened <laughs> yeah. uh, the estranged brother anyway um <laughs> 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 no nah, nah, ben's all right <laughs> anyway he called me up and he goes ruben you have to listen to the great cricketers Patreon this week. It's three hours of just nonstop gold. It's going to make you smile. And so when I heard that, I was like, wow, these guys have like really hit the money on what you guys are offering on Patreon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was um, – I put that together maybe a month ago. It, it was so – so like – so to describe what that is. So every week we um, have this show, Ask TJC, where people write in questions and then – over the course of five years, I reckon we have read out on the show 1,500 questions. means I've probably read close to 10,000 questions. Most of them absolute rubbish. Um, but some of them are just unbelievably funny. Um, and, uh, and the way people write it, the way they communicate it, you don't have to be like, a, you don't have to be Shakespeare writing it, but just the way, often like the funniest ones where it's just like a block of text. There's no <laughs> punctuation. No, and you're trying to read it. <laughs> it's, it's, like, it's like, is this funny or is this... Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, just recently put on like a, the, the best, of, like best of, um, and I, it ended up going for three hours because I'm a narcissist. Um, <laughs> it, it went for three hours just because there was so many funny moments. It was like, it was really nice going through it again because it was like all these questions through the annals of time of doing the show of like six years. It was like 300 episodes. So it's, yeah, it's a lot of hours of content um, to go through, but just going through it, it just reminded me of what we had built in that moment and like, and it, uh, in that best of episode, it wasn't really samurai talking. It was just us reading the questions that had come in because some of them are ju- they're just 
funny in itself. <laughs> yeah. I, I can't tell if it's narcissism or if it's like genuinely funny, but some of the stuff is like made me cry, like with, with laughter. <laughs> just like, there's this one story. We call it the eye poke story. I mean, yeah, the, the, the hint is in the title of what happens. Um, <laughs> but it's just, well. it's the most like juvenile story I've ever heard. It's just these kids are playing a school game in year 12 and one guy pokes another guy in the eyes. I mean, <laughs> some, when I sell it like that, yeah. It's genius. So you must sign up. Um, <laughs> but it was, uh, it, it, it still gets me every single time the story of it. And like, and with Sam, Sam read it and uh, he's like breaking up every like 30 seconds. And that makes it funny as well. You know, like you walk into a room of people and people are laughing, you laugh straight away. Even yeah. though you don't know what's being said. <laughs> it's similar to that. Anyway. Yeah. So we're very lucky to, to have that, but yeah, it was, um, it was, it was a really cool thing to put together. Mm, uh, that went around my cricket club when that story came out. Right. People fast forward straight to that bit in the episode. Yeah. I think that's now forms a part of the, the intro as well. Like we're not getting McDonald's <laughs> and you can blame my son. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, right. that's right, yeah. There's a dad as a cricket coach and his son let his son let the team down and he just didn't forgive his son. And then th- th- all the kids on the bus home wanted to get McDonald's and he said, you're not getting McDonald's, you can blame my son. <laughs> <laughs> that is, that is, that's some dark stuff right there. That is dark. It's layered. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Jesus. Um, slightly weird question, but one time, one, when I listen, listen to your episodes, one thing I marvel at is how uh, articulate both you and Sam are. Thank you. Is this, has that always been the case? How did you come to be so well-spoken? Sam's, Sam is very articulate. Um, and so I feel like I have to match him because it's a challenge. Um, we're competing against each other. I don't care if the show's good. I care if I have a good show. Um, um, I don't know. Uh, it's, I, don't, I don't know how to answer that. Um, I guess we've always been interested. Sam and I are both like comedy fans. And so I think that might, that might shape a little bit. I guess commun- if you're into comedy, like that is a form of communication. It's a big form of communication. So how you how you communicate your ideas um, is important, like even if you're telling a joke. And so probably, it's probably just inherent. you probably just in, ingrained in that sort mm. of thing when you're talking. Um, it's not like, it's not an act or anything like that. It's just how we, it's how we talk. I'm a little bit um, rougher than uh, Sam in that capacity, but he's very erudite. So, um, and I like to swear a lot. So between the two <laughs> of us, it sort of balances it out. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. I guess we went to... We went to schools and <laughs> jobs and stuff. Yeah. I don't know. Why do you talk like that? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. You've done me. Um, just English first language and yeah. yeah. Did some presentations at school. Did some learn presentations. How to talk. I did always like speaking at school. I did always like speaking at school. But yeah, I just I just wanted to be a comedian when I was a kid. And mm. So I did a law degree. Nice. <laughs> was there anything that you were like super poor at at the start? It like, could be to do with podcasting or presenting at shows or um, something like that that you had to sort of work on to, to get better interviews definitely for me interview yeah. questions interview questions um because at the beginning when you're talking to you know like your heroes at the beginning um or guys that have achieved the thing that you wanted to as a kid i.e play for australia or play for you know victoria or new south Wales or whatever um yeah a little bit nervous and sort of trying to find like the angle of like the questions to find and and having done like hundreds of interviews now you don't really get mm. nervous anymore also like i'm 30 how old am i 36 wow that was <laughs> wow that, that, was that went quick it's like it's like you just realized like <laughs> quite a blackout i just oh. was for the age i just was this room does that to people <laughs> <laughs> it's like a casino there's no visible exits yeah <laughs> um no clocks on the wall um uh you yeah, know like all the guys that have played for australia now are younger than you so um <laughs> yeah, you, you don't feel like intimidated anymore. But like one of the earlier interviews we had with Steve War, and Steve War was like, you know, one of my idols. I'm sure you guys as well. And like just his personality of being very stern. Like he could look at you and like those eyes go right through you. <laughs> so a bit like nervous talking about like, oh, like can I make this guy laugh? Do I want to ask like a slightly edgy question? And <laughs> or, but I think like at the beginning I was asking more like serious questions, and then I realized like I don't even find the questions that I'm yeah. asking interesting. So what's the point? Like, because if, because if, if I don't find them interesting, then the audience isn't going to win. Mm. So um, now I just ask the most ridiculous questions. <laughs> no, no, no. You, you, st- you still ask serious questions, but like you got to find it interesting. Not, I, I think to answer the question, I think that I was asking questions that 
I thought like a journalist would ask. Yeah. Or like what I observed on Channel 9 through Wild World Sports back in the 90s. I thought these yeah. are the questions that you should ask professional athletes. Mm. And I was like, but no one's listening to me because they think that I'm good. Mm. Or like mm. like a, 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 a pretending to be Tony Gregg. <laughs> like they want they wanted me to be me. And and yeah, it's the same with podcasting community. People people listen people listen for the the nucleus of the, the like the central tenant of the cricket, but they also fall in love with personalities as well. That's why yeah. That's why people take photos of you in bars from across the room and send you two <laughs> weeks later. That's why people do that. And also for weird stalker reasons. Yeah. <laughs> that's why you got that law degree. <laughs> that's, that's right. That was a protection. Protect yeah. myself from the public, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Um, uh, people who have helped you along the way, have there been any mentors, people you turn to for advice on different things, whether it's content-related, commercial-related, live show-related? I've relied on Sam a lot uh he probably has more um mentoring he, he's he's been really really good for the great cricketer in terms of managing relationships for us and giving us opportunities i.e the first opportunity to get to get a foot in the door at fox sports with our podcast um that was a that was a really huge thing he's been really good working with cricket australia um liaising with like you know um like commercial partners all that stuff because he looks after that side of the business so he, he's in terms of mentoring the great cricketer through our business development he's been entirely that um for me he has been a really big mentor for me um i've definitely i'm definitely a better person for having worked with him no doubt about that um and uh yeah i suppose my 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 inspirations come from um again i keep talking about comedy but like i that's i i look at that lens a lot more so my my inspirations through the great cricketer what i want to bring from my perspective mm -hmm comes from like comedians and like people that I aspired to be when I was younger. So I guess like they're just influences outside. Um, that, that, that two separate, that two competing ideas, I suppose, cause you're talking about, you know, um, how to, how, how did you rely on people to help you get to where you are? And I suppose I'm bringing external things mm. of who, who I aspire to where Sam was very much on the ground yeah. meeting people, you know, help working with cricket Australia is a really big thing. We've interviewed each of the last three CEOs, I think. Um, plus, like I think every single test player in the last like <laughs> ten years. <laughs> then you get into like the international areas as well. That that's that's all Sam's hard work. Um, you know, managing those relationships, and I just sort of turn up and press record, and <laughs> yeah. tell make a, a joke, of, yeah. tell a couple of jokes, and get off. Who are a couple of the comedians that you look up to? Seinfeld was my first one that I that I um, loved, and then Gervais would be my most influential for me. Um, I just laugh when you say his name. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like proper addicted to the Office UK. Yeah, yeah, but. yeah, yeah. I understand. So I, well, I watched the US Office, um, and that is also a very good show. But yeah. the UK Office mm. is yeah. the UK Office. But you're probably thinking like stand up, right? As well. Yeah. So I I came across him through the Office, but then yeah. his stand ups were like um, I, I think it was at that age as well. My mind was still expanding. <laughs> my brain was still growing. <laughs> And by that, I mean, I was 27. Yeah. Um, no, I think I was like 18, 19 when his first like stand-ups yeah. came up. And I was like, oh, no, this is... And that was on the back of Seinfeld, who was like, at the time, I think Seinfeld was still on TV when I was that age, was I? Yeah, maybe. Um, so, yeah, those those are the most influential comedians for me. So to stand on the same stage as Gervais in UK would have been dream come true then? That was that was so unbelievable, yeah. Um so he just, he performed at Le Lesser Square Theatre is the name of the theatre. Um, he performed there like two or three days ago. Um, so we were there in 2019. So in many ways, he was following us. Um, <laughs> he, uh, yeah, but just even being on the West End, it was just crazy. And then doing, so we did two shows in London. Um, and then that, the final show of that tour in 2019 was the one that sold out in a day. And just like that audience who were so keen to come and see that sold out in a day. And that, I mean, that was three years ago. We've, 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 expanded a lot since then the show we just did in india uh was it was only it was only very small i think it was 150 200 people it was something something like that but that sold out in 20 minutes so um the great career is like expanding and like it's mm. it's getting bigger and and i think a lot of that might be through the pandemic a, a lot of people like contact us um and they say really nice things to you um like you helped me get through the pandemic and and people's relationship with podcasting is so unique um and it, it's it's really bizarre because they know me, but I don't know who they are. <laughs> and so, but when they come up to you and they say that, those nice things to you about, you know, like you help me get through a breakup or 
someone passed away or the pandemic or that's like that's that is the most powerful thing but I mean, people have like gone through cancer um, treatments and stuff and message us saying like thank you for that and i just mm. always say like please never contact us again it's <laughs> 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 really mean um, <laughs> whoa yeah whoa okay <laughs> escalated um no so that's honestly um that is the most like powerful most rewarding thing um and, and you know sam and i just feel like we're just getting started in many capacities we've been going for god we've been doing this for 11 years i mean mm. the, the podcast element is the thing that's really taking off and that's been six so you know um but it feels like we're going somewhere and it's exciting um but just talking to more people who who love it um and care about it is uh yeah, it's 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 a really really cool thing um so yeah uh i like my job but <laughs> <laughs> um have you listened to jerry seinfeld's uh interview on the tim ferris podcast no i haven't no it's very, very good. I think you'll enjoy it. It goes yeah, yeah, yeah. right into the writing process of how he came up with everything. Yeah, yeah, okay. um, yeah, yeah. Something I've referred back to a number of times, but yeah, yeah if you're interested. Oh, man, I, love, I love I love all that stuff. I love this, the science of comedy, you know, mm. and like the – the. it's very easy to – I mean, he, he was – I've watched a couple of his last like uh, Netflix special stand-ups and they're like mm. – they're, they're not as good as what he was in his peak, so to speak. But, mm. like, but when I watched that – I watched like an absolute master at his craft, like the and the effort, the hours and hours and hours mm. that he put into that, uh, being the perfectionist sort of stand up, is like just completely overwhelming. Like, I mean, it's like a 10,000 hour theory, right? Mm. Doing all these flying hours. He is so good at that. Now, like, the jokes might not have been as good as what they were in, when he was doing, when he was on TV, but um, you can still appreciate a master at his craft. Yeah, for mm. sure. But I love yeah. all that stuff. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, some of your favourite moments, I know you just mentioned being on the same stage as Ricky Gervais, but was there a moment that sort of stands out as, you know, when you thought, oh, my God, this is actually my job? <sighs> um, yeah, so I – yeah. The stage ones is like – so being on stage is my favourite thing. I, I absolutely love that. And not having that for the last two, three years. We'll, we'll, we'll tour Australia end of this year um, as we usually do, but that'll be the first time since the pandemic. And then we'll go to India in February – and do like a national tour there and then the ashes is in england next year so so we'll be on stage in three different countries in the next 12 months which is like that's that's super exciting for me and, and sam as well um but yeah i think the stage things are like my favorite things like whoa like walking out in, on the west in the west end doing yeah. the grade cricketer like what, what's that <laughs> <laughs> what is that this isn't this wasn't supposed to happen yeah it's by like third grade like in sydney like not being very good and it's like, so good <laughs> um it's yeah it's always here yeah. i know like um Dave Grohl, when he's talking about now, I'm Dave Grohl. Um, <laughs> Dave Grohl talking about like the Foo Fighters, obviously like one of the biggest rock bands maybe ever. Um, and he's saying like, if I knew it was going to be big, I would never have called it the um, Foo Fighters. <laughs> and it's like I feel like the Grey Cricket's like, oh, I'm like so proud of like everything that Sam and I have done, and yeah. but it's the Grey Cricketer. Like, it's, <laughs> it's not that cool, is it? <laughs> not that cool. <laughs> Wish it was something better. Well, what would you rename yeah. it? The Ian Higgins Show. <laughs> been thinking of that one for a while. Yeah, yeah I'm, glad you, I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. Over yeah. in your head, I, said, I said that way too quickly. Yeah. <laughs> way too quickly. Wow, okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, um, this has been amazing. We've got one more question before we wrap up. But um, any advice you'd give to yourself when you're at the start of your journey? Um, yeah, rename the show. <laughs> um, advice at the beginning. Um, I... Just, just for just for my personal journey, like because I, I, yeah, I knew I wanted to do comedy, and I just it took me. A, I definitely did not think that talking about great cricket would be the avenue to like get me in front of you guys right now. So like a long, long journey. But um, I wish I pursued it younger, and I wish I had the belief of doing that. Like I, people say to you like you're talented and stuff. I'm no more talented than anyone else. So you just like, but once you care about something, then you get, you will work hard at it, and that's like people identified that as oh you're so talented but no it's like if you care about something you're going to work really really hard at it and i wish i worked at it harder when i was younger i sort of like floated around for basically my entire 20s not really sure i knew what i wanted to do and it's this but i didn't know how to do it mm. and i didn't i didn't look hard enough at how to do it so it's been unbelievably lucky that uh i've fallen into this job and met sam met the right people and had all the opportunities but the opportunities that we got to now is because like Sam and I care about and you work hard. So it's very lucky. So my advice would be um, 
stop pissing around in your 20s <laughs> and do something that you really care about because it's very, very rewarding if you get there. Love financially. that. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> That's such a I didn't mean that. Can I actually have some money for parking? <laughs> yeah. We did. <laughs> we probably do owe you, what is it, like 40 bucks for like a day here in Cremorne? It's ridiculous around here. It's so ridiculous. <laughs> Ran up to 100. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> it's worth it. We'd pay you 100 bucks to come in here, 100%. <laughs> yeah. I'll come in every day then. There's yeah. some ice creams in the fridge. Yeah. We've got, oh, we got cereal. There's free yeah, beer cereal, as well. Yeah. I know you mentioned you like beer, so yeah, that's come true. around any time. Uh, guys, I really appreciate you having me. It's, um, I was looking at you guys before, actually, the last week. I was looking at what you guys have done. It's, uh, it's amazing. It's very impressive what you do. I've seen you meetups and stuff in Brisbane and Sydney, and you've done one here as well, right? You must mm. have done one here. Um, that's very, very cool what you've done, what you've built here. So um, I hope it's going well for you. Well, it's obviously going well. Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you. We're, like you, Journey's just kind of been trying to figure out what people like along the way and mm -hmm. trying to double down on what niche we try to fill. So yeah. it's, yeah, we love talking to people like you because the journey kind of feels like we're at different stages and it's interesting and we get a lot of inspiration from hearing, you know, the shows you're doing in India and mm -hmm. the UK and all that sort of stuff because we feel like we're early on now. So thank you. Yeah, I know. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. Wow, Rubes, I need to breathe. <laughs> that was super funny, super insightful, uh, just great fun. And Ian's a great guy. So, mm. yeah, amazing. Uh, incredible episode. But I think uh, the main thing for people to take away from this is what he said at the end there. If you are passionate about something and you've got an idea, run while it run with it while you've got the energy, while you're young, just absolutely go for it because it's going to be the number one thing uh, that you become good at if you sincerely care about it. So mm. if that's you, if you've got something in the side of what you want to do at the moment and thinking about going all in or thinking about going harder at it, this is your uh, this is your call to action. Go go forth and do it. This is the wake up call. Exactly right. Telling you to go do it. And you could tell at the end there, you kind of said, God, I wish I did this when I was younger. Mm. And you don't want to have that, you know. And not not that he would change anything for the world. He's mm. done absolutely fantastically, but you can tell that he he, just, he wished he did it, you know, 10 years ago instead of, you know, recently. So oh, when you find something you love, you want to be spending your entire life doing it. Yeah. So why yeah. not? So it's an amazing piece of advice, mm. uh, which is fantastic. Yeah. Um, hey, there's probably, there's probably not another episode that compares to that one. But <laughs> in the world of media and, and things like that, mm. any other podcast that someone can listen to to – so to get another view on what we just spoke about. Yeah, absolutely. So Hamish McLaughlin is probably the biggest media talent that we've had on this podcast and fantastic, of course, as well. Uh, yeah, uh, jostling for number one spot, I reckon. <laughs> uh, uh, Hamish McLaughlin is episode 124. Uh, Kath Lochnan, Fox Sports presenter. She's episode 28. She's also brilliant if you're into media and, and journalism. So I would check out those two. And uh, if you're looking at commentary, from a football perspective, the world game, soccer, go and check out Simon Hill. He is episode 161, I reckon. Nice. Great work. The memory's working well as per usual. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, connect with us on LinkedIn. Plus, be sure to jump into the SportsGrad community. We would love to chat with you inside there. So head to our website at sportsgrad.com.au slash community to join or head to the link in our show notes. Also, if you love the show, and you just love that show with Ian, we would love for you to rate the show five stars wherever you listen to your podcast. Subscribe on Apple or follow on Spotify. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.